Unit 4, Part 2, Types of Grasses. In this section of uh, Unit 4, we'll look at the most common types of grasses that humans use, um, the structure of those grasses, and uh, how we use them, how they grow. The most common grasses that humans use are the cereals, barley, wheat, and rye. Uh, corn can also kind of be included in that cereal group. And here we see a uh, barley, wheat, and rye. Notice that they're seed heads that combine multiple seeds in the same structure, varying sizes of seeds. Um, wheat, most commonly used cereal grain in uh, the U.S., um, requires a bit better soil conditions uh, and moisture than uh, rye. Um, rye can withstand uh, much more in the way of drought and heat and that sort of thing, so it's more common in warmer areas of the world. Um, barley kind of falls between the two in requirements. The cereals are edible grains. So they're the edible grains of the grasses, um, wheat, barley, rye, oats, also included in that group. Now, technically, the seeds of all grasses are edible. Um, it just so happens that these are among the largest seeds and also the most palatable seeds to humans. Um, this map shows where wheat originated, sort of a uh, Middle Eastern plant, like so many things in the beginning of agriculture. The blue area is where wheat is commonly grown today. And notice that wheat can be grown in semi-tropical areas, such as Florida, areas of Mexico, um, parts of Brazil, but it also can grow in much colder regions across the northern U.S. and Canada, across uh, northern Europe and Asia. The wheat that we grow today is commonly referred to as domesticated wheat. Um, and there are three kinds of wheat, einkorn and emmer, which are hybridized to make what we refer to as bread wheat today, taking the best uh, of both of those types of plants, large seeds of emmer wheat, hardiness of einkorn wheat, and creating a large seeded, hardy type of grass that we refer to as bread wheat. Over here we can see a diagram of the grain of a wheat plant. The hull or the bran was the fusing of the seed coat and uh, the fruit wall. The endosperm to provide nutrients as the new plant starts to grow. And of course, the embryo, which is the new plant itself. So the diagram, regardless of the type of uh, grass it is, those parts of the seed remain the same. Bread, the wonder food. We don't really think of bread I think uh, much day to day as being a wonder food, but it was a huge advancement um, and allowed civilization really to take root and flourish. Why is that? Well, bread is something that humans can eat immediately. Doesn't re Once it's prepared and cooked, it doesn't require more preparation beyond that. It contains a lot of carbohydrates for energy for humans and it's easily portable so that instead of having to find food along the way if humans were going to travel, um, they could simply make some bread and carry that with them as a lightweight source of 
energy. It allowed a lot of exploration to happen. But bread can also be stored, as grain can be stored, for relatively long periods of time. That allowed people to sort of plan ahead and make enough, harvest enough grain, make enough bread to last for a period of weeks that allowed them to do other things rather than worrying about where their next meal was going to come from. And it has been said that bread allowed for the rise of civilization and quite literally for the development of cities. As I said, it's a lightweight food. It lasts a long time without spoiling. People could go great distances while carrying a food supply rather than trying to rely on what they could gather or hunt along the way. And it's high in carbohydrates for quick energy. The next grain that we'll talk about is becoming possibly the most important. Um, it's in the top three with wheat, rice, uh, as the other two of the most important grains uh, grown in the world today. A corn plant, notice the structure is a little different uh, than a standard grass plant in that it tends to create a single tiller from the crown, though occasionally you'll get multiple tillers. The leaves still attach to the tiller, just like they do on your lawn grasses. Uh, an interesting thing about the corn plant is that it has separate male and female flowers. And the male flower, called the tassel, is at the top of the plant, up here. The female flower is where the ear develops. And the female parts are the silks that hang out from this. The reason the corn plant is designed or structured this way is because the male parts release pollen. And the corn plant is pollinated by wind. So when the pollen is released, it begins drifting away from the corn plant and at the same time, typically falling, so that it will eventually land on the female flower of a neighboring plant. Once fertilization takes place, then the ear develops and develops the seeds. So, as I said, they have separate male and female flowers or florets. The tassel and the ears, each unisexual, the tassel is male. The ears are female and being wind pollinated, it allows the pollen to drift down next to it hitting other corn plants. Corn is an interesting plant in that it was developed from other plants that are barely edible. And without human intervention, corn can't multiply and grow by itself. So if humans stop taking care of corn within a very short period of time, a couple of years, we would have no more corn left on the planet. There are three main varieties of corn there's flint corn and dent corn and flower corn. We'll take a look at these. Dent corn is the type, the largest type grown on farms in the US. Um, and as you can see in the uh, photograph here, these kernels each appear to have a little dent in the top and that's where it gets its name. Um, as the seed matures, the starch on the sides of the kernel um, becomes hardened. The top of the kernel has somewhat softer starch. That part of the seed coat fruit wall fused together is a little softer than on the side. The side harder material, the horny starch, the crown contains soft starch. As the grain matures, it begins to dry out, lose moisture, and the top caves in a little bit because it's softer and the inside is shrunken. The sides are hard starch, so they don't shrink in, but the top can, and that's what causes that characteristic dent. 
In another type of corn called flint corn, the hard starch or horny starch from the side extends all the way over the top of the kernel. So even though the kernel will shrink, the inside will shrink a little as it dries out, um, there will be no uh, denting in the top. Um, dent corn has the ability to germinate at a lower temperature than, or flint corn has the ability to germinate at a lower temperature than dent corn. And so in cold climates, flint corn becomes the preferred uh, corn. It also incidentally becomes a preferred corn in tropical climates because it's more resistant to uh, attack by an insect called the weevil. So in colder and hotter areas, flint corn, in temperate areas in the middle, dense corn. Popcorn is a variety of flint corn where the there's no dent in the top of it. Um, and it contains a small amount of water or moisture, even after drying and maturing. When that's heated to a certain temperature, basically at the boiling point of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, that water is converted to steam. When water changes to steam, it expands in size 15 times. And that's what causes the uh, popcorn to split open, pop, and expand. Flower corn is the third type of corn, and it has um, softer starch or less densely packed starch, so it's very easy to grind into meal. Um, it was grown and still is uh, pretty extensively in the mountainous regions of South America that were part of the Inca Empire. Um, most of the grinding of corn to uh, flour or meal uh, was done by hand, and so it was important to have a corn where that process was easier, and flour corn is that kind of corn. Sweet corn is a type of uh, dent corn, and this is corn that we commonly eat before we allow it to fully mature and dry out. Um, for human consumption, this in the United States is the most common type of corn. Elsewhere in the world, flour corn is the most common type of corn for human consumption because it can be made into all sorts of uh, bread-like substances and tortilla and that sort of thing. Um, in the US, we eat a lot of sweet corn. Um, the sugars that exist in sweet corn, in the seeds of sweet corn, don't get converted to starch to the extent that they do in the other types of corn. And that's why sweet corn is typically sweet, where the name comes from. Um, the leaves that you can see on the husk, see, you can see some leaves growing out of the husk. That's typical of corn grown in uh, temperate regions. In the uh, corns grown in um, tropical regions, uh, you see very little, if any, uh, leaf growth from the husk. The husk is tightly wrapped around the ear um, without these projecting leaves. Pod corn is a type of corn that is grown primarily uh, for decoration. What separates pod corn from the other types of corn is that in addition to having a husk that grows around the ear, each individual kernel has its own tiny husk around it. It makes for an interesting looking piece of corn, um, not as convenient for eating because you have all those little husks to deal with, um, but like I said, often grown as decoration. Indian corn is, um, can come from either the flower corn or dent corn groups. Uh, the flower corn um, and, and dent corn, so that it means it's edible. 
uh, though typically when we grow this in, in uh, the United States, we're growing it for uh, decorations similar to pod corn. Um, has the bright colors, um, multiple colors of seeds on the ears, um, very decorative for fall, however it is edible. So where did corn come from? I mentioned that corn was developed from plants that were barely edible in themselves. Um, and here we have a photograph that will, helps illustrate one of the theories. Uh, Trypsacum, this larger grass, and Teosente, this smaller grass, in one theory at least, were hybridized to create what we call corn. I also mentioned that in the United States, we refer to this plant as corn. The rest of the world uh, generally refers to it as maize because corn is a generic term for any small type of grain uh, in the rest of the world. So to be specific, uh, the rest of the world uses the term maize. Um, but Teosinte has pretty much been confirmed as being one of the ancestors of corn, the thought is that uh, Trypsacum is one of the other, and that by hybridizing these plants, uh, a taller, single-stalked corn plant with larger ears and bigger seeds was developed from these two plants. Here we see Teosente. And what we can tell about this, looking at it, you see there's a single row of seeds. In modern corn, we have multiple rows of seeds. It's thought that the, back to our previous slide, that the trypsacum contributed maybe the multiple rows of seed. And between the two, modern corn developed. This chart shows a breakdown of how we use corn products in the United States. Um, if we look for uh, human food products, of all the corn we grow in the United States, only one and a half percent of it ends up being used for food products. The single largest quantity almost 48 percent is used as animal feed. The next single largest quantity is used as ethanol. Now, more recent numbers indicate that ethanol might actually now be account for 33 percent of the corn crop to make alcohol for fuel. So if this increases, where does the where does it come from? Where do we get that extra corn to jump from 17% to 33%? Primarily from exports, surplus, and some from animal feed. This is making corn more expensive around the world, not just in the U.S., because we have less to export. There are other countries that don't grow as much as the U.S., um, so supply and demand increases the cost of corn. Rice combined with corn and wheat, they form the sort of the uh, three most important grain crops that we grow. Rice is a grass, but different than most of the other grasses, it requires standing water for at least part of its life cycle in order to grow. Based on the number of people dependent on it as a primary food, rice is the number one food grain in the world. From this diagram down here, we can see the structure is kind of the same. 
as all of the other graphs. We have bran, we have the germ, we have the endosperm. In rice and in wheat as well, there's this outer coating called chaff, which is removed in processing. There are different types of grass. Um, you can see A is a long, thin grain rice that has a purple hull. Uh, B, a rounder grained rice with a whitish hull. Um, C, golden hulled rice. And you can see some purple hulled, purple leafed rice in the background. And D, a light hulled, weedy type of rice. In all cases, the grain of rice itself, when removed from the hull and the husk, uh, is white, regardless of the color of the outside. Now, as I said, rice is probably the number one grain in terms of number of people dependent on it. And because it requires standing water to grow, it requires relatively level fields so that the water will stand in the fields. In places where there's not much available level land, the land has been terraced into rice paddies in layers, as we can see in this uh, picture on the left. In the picture on the right, this woman is not harvesting rice. What's happening here is rice seeds were broadcast in a seed bed and they germinate up to about this size. At this point, they're pulled out of that field and taken to a paddy and planted uh, one by one, essentially, uh, plant by plant in the rice paddies. They're allowed to grow uh, to maturity in the rice paddies and then an opening is cut in the walls around surrounding the patties, allowing the water to drain out. That then allows the fields to be dried so that people can get in and harvest the rice crop. There's a plant called a zola or a water type of water fern that grows in rice paddies. At one point, it was thought to be kind of a weed and a pest, um, but it turns out that, like the legumes, um, this water fern, Azola, has a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria, and that bacteria has the ability to fix nitrogen from the air, take gaseous nitrogen in the air, and the air we breathe is 78% nitrogen. Um, take that nitrogen from the air, and convert it to a form of nitrogen that rice plants and other plants can take advantage of. So rather than being a weed or a pest, um, it is in fact a uh, source of uh, fertilizer for the rice plants and is now encouraged to grow in rice paddies.